Welcome to the Startup Grind. Hey, hey. All right, you guys. End of the week, you guys made it this far, huh? Impressive, you're still here. So um, who here has been to a Startup Grind event before? Okay, a few of you guys. This is good. So every month, um, I run an event series here in town that keeps this startup love going all year, and it's called Startup Grind. The mission of Startup Grind is to help people like you, people that are founding companies. We try and educate, inspire, and connect you to each other through these fireside chats. So every month, I round up some kind of a really amazing, successful entrepreneur that has been down the hard road and made it to the other side. And then I help them tell their story. The cool thing is, we don't just look at the pretty parts. We don't just do the Forbes version. We talk about really how they got there so that you can hear the stories of how they overcame some of the challenges that you, trying to build your own company or startup, are experiencing as well. So that's a little bit about what Startup Grind is. You can join us every month. The next one is March 15th, and we'll be there to support you as a community throughout the entire year. Today, our, our speaker is, um, he's a pretty cool guy. I must admit, I didn't know he was here in town. It's really fun when we find one that hasn't yet made it into the heart of the community. So Jeff Katz actually has been an entrepreneur pretty much most of his career. Um, but back in 2001, he stepped back from everything he had been trying and decided he wanted to kind of take a pause, take a moment, and really study what he could bring into this world. Whatever he did worked, because 12 years later, the company that he co-founded with his brother sold for $1.65 billion. That's the one with a B. So, join me in welcoming to the stage to tell his story, Jeff Katz. Yeah, have a seat. All right, so this is for you. We're double mic'd here, so oh, okay. one's for the video, one's for us. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right, so we like to learn a little bit about the person behind the story of success as well, so we're just going to start by talking about Jeff. Tell us about your early life, your kind of your childhood, your family, where you grew up. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about you. Okay. Uh, grew up in New York, Long Island to be exact. <laughs> um, my dad was a scientist, you know, a, uh, a chemistry teacher um, in high school. My mom was a social worker. Um, so we, business wasn't really part of uh, growing up, um, not formally, um, but uh, um, we would play these games. Like my dad uh, would, uh, we, we would uh, um, drive by like town and there'd be an open store and he would say, uh, I wonder what's going to go in that. And, uh, and we'd say, uh, and, and then like a couple weeks later, you know, a new store would go in and he'd say, uh, not going to make it. Not going to yeah. make it. And, uh, and usually he was right. And then we started, you know, started us thinking, you know, wow, what could work there? And, uh, and you know, we, my brother and I started as entrepreneurs early. Um, we were selling t-shirts for concerts, you know, at uh, the, the uh, Long Island Coliseum, I think. <laughs> and uh, silk screening in the basement and, and uh, um, you know, uh, uh, my brother mostly was doing it, but I was too young and, uh, um, but I got a taste of, of being an entrepreneur at an early age. When you were young, so not coming from a family that was super supportive of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, what did you want to be when you grew up? What, was, what were your early thoughts on what your career would turn out to be? Initially, I wanted to be a surgeon. A surgeon? Yeah. All right. Yeah. But my, my grades weren't quite Not good quite. enough. Okay. And uh, well, we're I glad you didn't become a surgeon. And it sounds like you turned out just fine on the other side. So that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. A late bloomer. Very good. Um, so what about your early career? Like, just well, what did you study in school, and then what were the first few things that you did in your sure, career? Sure, sure. I studied accounting, believe it or not, um, because I'm the first thing from an accountant. I'm not really, uh, I don't have great attention to detail. I'm more of a big picture guy. And, uh, um, but I got a touch of, I got a bug for marketing and sales when I was in school. Okay. Um, you know, I uh, started, uh, on the other side of the credit card business. You know, I was actually uh, getting people, I was one of those annoying people in shopping malls and on the beach, g 
having people fill out applications for Sears credit cards. <laughs> and I, I, you know, one way or another, you know, I kind of figured, I kind of gamed the system and was you know, making like $100 an hour as a college kid. That's great. And, and so you know, sales kind of, you know, kind of pulled me in. Makes sense. So you saw that there was, there was cash flow and money available in the payment processing stuff from the other side first. And then, so ultimately then, as you moved forward to around the year 2000, Mercury Payment Systems kind of evolved to become a thing. Tell yes. us about the research you did and kind yeah. of what, what brought you to that. Okay. Okay. So I had, uh, I had been involved earlier on in my career um, in the credit card processing space. And uh, I wasn't really, uh, I, had a cl I was close to being successful, but I got put out of business. And, and you know, unfairly, and, you know, and uh, six years later, and a lawsuit, um, you know, completely derailed me. Let me guess, a partner. I'm, I'm sorry? A partner, right? Um, no, no? no, actually a supplier. A the company, actually, the processing company that was supposed to be paying us stopped paying us. Ah, uh, Okay, and so business. largely put out of business. Yeah. And so, uh, um, you know, that, so I walked away from the business for a while, did some other things, financial planning, nothing that I had great passion for, which is a big problem. You know, if you don't have great passion, you're going to be mediocre at just about anything you do. And so um, in 2000, 2000, you know, that was monumental for a lot of things. It was. It was uh, and, uh, Y2K. And, and that's right. And so um, I committed, I made a commitment to myself that if it's the last thing I do before I die, and I meant it at the time, I'm going to get back into the payment business, which I left, and, become, and start a successful company. So how did I go about it? I, I, since I was out of the business for a while, I, des I decided I'm going to spend the next year or so researching. I need to know the industry better than anybody, especially since I don't have any, I don't have big funding or any funding. Um, I'm going to need to, I'm going to need to know this business better than anybody. So um, how do you think you, how do you go about learning an industry that you've been at it for, you know, seven years or 10 years? Um, what I did was I went, I started from backwards from like, you know, 1992. And I started reading everything available that was relevant to what I was planning on doing. And along the way, you start, you start seeing trends. There's all kinds of technology trends. And you start betting on the ones that are going to make it. And by, bring, by starting in the past and bringing it to the current, to the present, it makes it easy to to know where the, what the future is going to be like. In other words, what's, what technologies, what trends are going to converge into the future. And what did, you, what did you find around that time that stood out to you? Yeah, so in the payment processing space, um, many of you have seen these little terminals that you swipe your card through. Well, that, those for the better businesses are kind of a thing of the past because the point of sale systems, the computer based point of sale systems, and even cash registers, now you could swipe a credit card uh, through and um, it's faster because they use the broadband internet. And so in, in 2000, when I was doing my research, what I saw was that these computer based POS systems are becoming, um, becoming a normalcy for, for any, any good business that wasn't trying to steal, you know, steal sales tax. Um, any, any good business is going to have a point of computer-based point of sale system, and also broadband. It wasn't really, it wasn't prevalent for small businesses back then. But I saw that it was that it was trending towards that. And so, if you put broadband together with high speed with credit cards. Um, you high speed credit card processing, two seconds versus 12 to 15 seconds was, was going to be a hot, a hot commodity. That's perfect. It's hard to remember back to 2001 when we didn't have high speed internet everywhere, but you're yeah. right, that was just starting to become available and so computer processing 
That's right. was going to be, that makes right. sense. It's cool that you Beautiful. saw it before it happened. That's right. Remember AOL and uh, Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> A good example of it, yes, exactly. Yeah. So we'll talk about how you leveraged that to um, to create your, you know, your customer base. But before we do that, let's talk about when you were founding the company. How did you pull together the money to be able to get it off the ground? Mm -hmm. um, wow, I I, uh, I in, in the first year I did a year of research, locking myself into a one room office, you know, every day for like fifteen hours, and. Uh, and I, you know, had to break my IRAs, uh, paid penalties and taxes, and and then, you know, basically played the the uh, credit card game of, of zero interest, and then moving it over to another. Um, and so I did, you know, I I didn't have a backup, plan, which is which is important for um, most entrepreneurs. You have to be all in, you know, and That's true. And, uh, and so. Um, you know, beg, borrow, and steal, and then really steal. <laughs> That's good. That's I really good. beg either. Not even sales tax? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even steal sales tax? No, not okay, even. Okay, good. Sales tax. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, the way that you, so with this situation that you saw where you mm -hmm. thought that business owners were going to be able to use the internet to process their credit cards because mm -hmm. high speed was available, um, you know, still you were looking at a market trying to come in as a credit card processing company. Yeah where you were competing against large banks with brands that everybody knows. So right. tell us about how you figured out to enter that market. Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, our competitors were Chase and Bank of America, Wells Fargo, First Data, you know, billion dollar companies. A lot of trust, a yes. lot of, yeah. And, and, uh, and as a startup, you know, how do you actually get, grab business away from these big companies, big safe sounding companies? Um, not easily. You have to. You have to be very strategic, right? So, um, they all. All of these organizations have sales forces that that uh, they utilize to bring in new accounts. What we wanted to do, much like Uber did in in uh, in car with car riding, we wanted to tap into a new sales force, and that was what we once we identified that that point of sale systems were really going to be the, the future, high speed credit cards through them. What we then looked at was who are the ones selling those systems? Um, and those were point of sale resellers. And, or, uh, and that's great, you know, we could actually work with them. Hold on, first we need, first our technology, we need to have technology, high speed credit card processing. Second of all, we need to get it integrated into lots and lots of different point of sale systems, you know, before we actually get these resellers to resell our payment service. Then we had the com further complication that, you know, they never, most of them have never sold credit card processing and, you know, that was never sold anything but point of sale systems and, and, the, and the ribbons that go in the printers and, you know, and they never sold a service before. Um, and one of the early concerns that we heard from them was that they didn't want to be perceived by their customers as double dipping. In other words, making it off of the point of sale system and then making it off of the credit card processing. And they didn't want any additional learning, they didn't want a big learning curve, and they didn't want additional work, you know. And so we tailored our sales program around their, around their needs and concerns. And the way we did that, um, well, first of all, we went, we, we went after those, we, uh, we found a technology partner that was, um, that coined the phrase dealer-centric. And we learned all about how to be dealer-centric. What that means is, is, uh, is working around their concerns and their, and, you know, their needs. Um, they, you know, they, uh, they, they want something that's easy to learn, they don't have to do very much, and they make lots of money. You know? <laughs> that's what dealer-centric means, huh? That's right. And, it's, and, and you put them in a position to win if you're a supplier of theirs or partner of theirs. You have to always position them in a, you know, to win and to look good. You can't, if you, if, you, if you leave them as a partner of theirs with egg on their face, it's all over. That makes sense. Right. Yeah, so, and as a strategy to enter a market, that worked out brilliantly for you because 
once you were able to get them wrapped around the idea of including credit card processing as a part of their service to their customers, suddenly you now have mm -hmm. gotten this right. wide band of customers that they have already worked to get That's as right. your customers. That's right. That was, that was a big part of the plan. It yeah. wasn't just the fact that we're getting them to sell to new customers. Both. We're getting them to go back to their base of customers and you know, when Chase and Bank of America are knocking on their customers' doors, they're knocking from the outside. Knock, mm -hmm. knock, I'd like to tell you about credit card processing, save you money. Right. We're coming in from, we're, our partners, our, our resellers that we started working with, were coming, were ready on the inside. They were a trusted advisor mm -hmm. to their businesses that each, each one of the resellers, let's say, had on average 100 restaurants and retail customers, well, you know, which is great, but each point of sale developer that we got integrated into for faster processing, for revenue sharing with them and their resellers, had about 100, had about 100 resellers. So, you know, 100 times 100 is 10,000. That means that we're on the inside track for 10,000 retail and restaurant customers and that's just one developer. Right, right. Okay. So well done. So the idea is to the idea is to create, you know, building an ecosystem, create an environment where everyone wins. That's in your ecosystem. Yeah. And it's very predictable what the outcome is going to be. And we talk about this because this is a principle that people can apply in, in other situations as well. Mm -hmm. um, so. You, you did your research, you jumped into this, um, you know, what you saw as this opportunity, you leveraged yourself heavily, took away all your security, took out a bunch of debt. Um, how long, how many years in was it to where you felt, okay, this is going to work out, we're, we're profitable, we're solid. How long till you kind of hit that point where you felt like you could see that things yeah. were going to go okay? I would say three years. Okay. So three years, so the first year we were, we were um, having the technology built, you know, having our, our servers built and, and uh, um, getting the technology built. The second year was getting the software developers to integrate and to uh, do the testing on their, on their customers, you know, alpha testing, beta testing. Okay? And then really the third year we started selling and pretty, maybe two and a half years because once we started selling, um, we knew. You knew. We knew. Okay, good. So, so yeah, I mean, your, your career is a perfect example of what we see a lot. When a person really loves entrepreneurship, you know, even though they get hit down a couple times, they still pop back up and keep going again. Mm -hmm. But it's hard for people that aren't of that mindset to really support or understand what the heck we're doing sometimes when we take these giant risks that leverage, yeah. leverage ourselves. So um, how did you deal with outside perspectives that kind of questioned who you were and what you were doing and why you were doing it as you were so driven to continue throughout your entire career? Really? I ignored them. You ignored them. Okay. Yeah. yeah <laughs> All right. Think, yeah. I think that, you, that it's easy to get derailed by negativity. It is. It's true. Really easy. You know, why don't you just get a job? You know, how could you go through the savings? You know, what happens if you fail? Right. Um, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to, uh, um, you know, you have to be blind and, and deaf to ne negativity. Yeah, I get it. Okay. So let's talk about how you built your company now. So, you know, any company um, is only as good as the people in it to a large extent. So mm -hmm. it, do you have any, mm -hmm. anything that you found over the years that, to find the right people and to recognize them when they come along? and to build a cohesive team, anything yes. around that? Yes, well, first of all, we built this company, you know, we didn't build it in New York, we didn't build it in Phoenix, we built it in Durango, Colorado, you know, where, where there is, I think, 15,000 people. Wow. Right, so uh, not, the, not the place you would think, you know, to start a growth company. Not a big pool to choose from either. That's right, that's right. So, um, and how many people had credit card processing experience? Um, you know, out of when, once we got to a hundred people, how many people do you think still had, you know, have, had credit card processing experience besides me? Yeah. Zero. Right. You know, I was the only one. And that was planned. Number one, I was in Durango, Colorado, and there weren't anybody, there wasn't anybody else. 
But number two, what we wanted to do was hire, we had a very disruptive, different model. We didn't want the baggage of, you know, of, of uh, employees that thought they knew how it should be done based upon what they did at Bank of America or, or, or First Data. And so we, we made it our business to hire really smart people that, had, that, that shared the same or similar values that we shared and we articulated. And we had a very strong mission, which was, our mission was to dominate the, the integrated payment, payment processing um, field by adding value to our partners and their, and their businesses. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, sometimes people do take the strategy to bring in industry experts, but that's, that's, that's interesting. You saw that as more of a, a risk or baggage. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at today, uh, and you see in the news a lot, a lot of people that focus on building a team and culture through a lot of, you know, you see the flashy perks and the crazy fun things, mm -hmm. the colorful offices and things like that. What's your opinion on what it is that really makes a team gel and a culture for a company? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's not that. You know, I mean, I mean that's a, that's a, yeah. the perks are are fun, and if you're going to, you know, if you're going to work like they work in Silicon Valley, which is you know, which is kind of insane, yeah. Um, yeah. then yeah, maybe that's what you need. You need uh, pool tables and and beds to more for to, marketing to, to get them to pay attention to you. Yeah, and get them. To, and, and, and if you're competing against Facebook and Google in yeah, Silicon yeah. Valley, maybe you need that and snacks and free lunches. But uh, I believe in lean startups, you know, because uh, you, in, in the startup phase, um, that the people that understand um, what they're trying to build, what the mission of the company is, and that are really great team members, those things are really superfluous. What's most important is the mission of the company, and being and joining a company with like-minded values. Right. right. Very good. Right. Okay. So fast forward a few years. Tell us about kind of um, the kind of the the changes as you went through leaving the company mm -hmm. or, or exiting the company. Yes. And then um, we'll talk about where you've been since. Okay. So you know, previous to this, I you know I've had other companies, but the most employees I've ever had was 15, right? And this was a, you know, this, you know, we got to 15 employees, you know, within the first, uh, uh, first year. Um, and so, big difference between, between running and inspiring, you know, hundreds of people, which we got to, and, and we saw we were gonna get to, than, than 15. So, early on, we brought in a, a, uh, when we had, I think, 30 employees, we brought in a coach, you know, a consultant mm -hmm. that, uh, she was a growth consultant. Mm -hmm. And so she coached us and the, the team, the executive team, as well as the employees on what is next, you know, what, they're, what to expect next. Right. And one of the things that she told us that turned out to be true was that the same people that got you here are not the same people that are going to get you there. It's unfortunate, but that is usually the case. Yes, a lot of times the people, the, the, the great managers of a small company that could, run, that, could, <laughs> that could run their department, they're a superhero, you know, with IT, but it's just them and maybe one other person is not the same person often that's capable, capable of growing an IT department of 20 or 30 people because they can't let go a lot of times, right? They, they can't delegate and hold people accountable. And so it's really, really, really tough conversations to have. Yeah. And if you really want a great company, you have to do the right thing and, and let them go. You owe that to the other people, you owe it to the mission of the company to do that. A lot of, yet a lot of executives can't do that and don't do that. So right. that's first step into mediocrity. That makes sense. So as you made it into that new level of things, 
and then as the company eventually did it get acquired is that basically what you mm -hmm. how it how it moved on yeah well initially uh, I think 2010 uh, Silver Lake partners um, actually they made an investment they bought 61 percent of the company and and uh, basically uh, you know became board members and and uh, and ran the company by the numbers Gotcha. Yeah. Which is a different thing for you as well. I mean, yes. as a founder, the moment that you give away the controlling interest in your company to someone else, you no longer feel like your own boss anymore. So that's, that's a very right. different experience. That's right. That's right. You know, brilliant people, but they do not, they don't, working, running the company by the numbers isn't what inspired a lot of people, including myself, in the first place. Sure. Absolutely. So as you moved on from that, um, these days, you've been doing some investing. Tell us a little bit about what type of startups catch your eye. Yeah, uh, sure. So, um, I'm, I've invested quite a bit around commerce, whether it's uh, whether they're mobile apps for mobile payments. You now, one of the companies, Card Free, that I've uh, invested in is uh, they're doing the mobile programs for Taco Bell and Dunkin' Donuts. Originally, they built the they built the app. This team for Starbucks, hmm. and you know the, uh, that's a pretty I imagine popular that app. You, I hear you use the Starbucks app. <laughs> I see some heads. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, great team, experienced. Uh, don't I don't have to do a whole lot of hand holding, and and uh, um, the executive team is just you know they're rock stars, and that. That's what I prefer. I do not like to get to get into uh, uh, to get into their business and and uh, have to make changes. Yeah, that That's, makes sense. Oh. So another company that I've invested in um, recently is called Hirewire, and they they it's an app that right now they're they're still in um, just getting started in Atlanta, but. Their tagline is "Let your next job find you," and it's it, think about online dating where you create profiles instead of uh, for dating, but for employment. And employers will look, watch a little video clip of you answering five questions, and from that they will uh, invite you in for an interview. But usually by that time, they pretty much know that they want to hire you. These are for like fast food workers, typically. Oh, very cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So what do you think? A lot of the people here are either looking to launch a company or in their first maybe, you know, one to five years where they're still what we would call in the grind, right? Yeah. Like just still really working hard, hoping that their dreams pay off. Like what advice do you have for them? Um, focus. You know, it's great to um, have long-term visions, but you have to you have to be able to execute, and to do that, you really need to focus um, and get some get some quick wins. Another thing is uh, mistake that I've made is really um, in the past is uh, is not focusing on on the distribution channel. How am I going to sell this? Focusing on building a widget of some sort and then making it as an afterthought who's going to sell this? Uh, bad idea. That's the classic mistake we make as entrepreneurs. Yes. So good, good call. Yeah, so really, the, it's great to have a, an idea for a widget. The next thing is who's going to sell it and how should I tailor that widget for who's going to sell it? And then, who's gonna, who, and then who are they going to sell it to? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So before we go into the public Q&A, we do this little thing each time called 21 questions rapid fire. Sure. So I'm going to ask him questions, you guys, and he's going to tell us his thoughts. These are going to be quick, and these are going to help you get to know Jeff a little bit. And whether you're on Team Jeff or whether you want to, like, shoot him with a dart gun because he disagrees, okay? But don't please don't shoot him with a dart gun. That's not, that's not real. <laughs> All right. So here we go. First one, cats or dogs? Dogs. Beer or wine? Wine. Sushi or tacos? Sushi. Coke or Pepsi? Neither. <laughs> All right. Favorite app? Um, 
LinkedIn. Favorite operating system? Um, iOS. <laughs> Political statement there, I feel like. Um, <laughs> favorite holiday? Um, I don't know. Christmas. Okay. Favorite type of car? Um, Bentley. Favorite vacation spot? Uh, Hawaii. Favorite book? Um, good to great. Favorite movie or TV show? Um, uh, that's a good one. Blacklist. Ooh, that is good. Um, favorite musician, artist? Mm, the Who. Your go-to karaoke song? Mm, I don't have one. None? <laughs> I wasn't going to make you sing it. You could still tell us. God, it's been such a long time. It's been too long, huh? Karaoke, All right, we've got to get you up for karaoke, man. All right, anything you collect? Any, I'm sorry? Do you collect anything? Oh, collect. Startup companies. Okay. <laughs> we'll go with it. I like it. Any unusual skills or talents? Uh, I play chess. Chess. All right. Mm -hmm. You have a fan. I heard that. Mm -hmm. um, your top strength in business? Um, I would say um, distribution, sales and, sales and marketing. That's great. Um, what profession, other than the, those that you've tried, would you wish to attempt? Hmm. I would say uh, maybe, maybe uh, astrophysics. Oh my, all right. What is the best compliment someone can give you? Mm. Best compliment? Um, probably that I'm a good person. A cause you're passionate about? Global warming. And climate change. <laughs> climate change. One thing on your bucket list. Mm, bucket list. Um, meet Bill Gates. Meet Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. That wasn't too painful. No. No. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to take a few questions. We don't have a mic to pass, so you're going to um, need to stand up and be a little bit loud for me. I'll repeat the question for the video, and then we'll let him answer. So, yes, right here. So okay. as you transition from a small company to a large company, how do you transition the culture in that, in that okay. change? Yeah, so really important to have, to articulate your mission and values. And what you'll find if you, if uh, what I found was that everyone needs to, li you know, to live the values to, to, to uh, you know, everyone, including, including uh, myself and my brother. And if we don't, then you've heard the term, a, a fish stinks from the head down, right? And that's true, it's very true. You know, uh, if, the, if the founders don't actually live the values, then nobody else will, or, or nobody else thinks it's important. So we articulate a mission values, and, and uh, we would actually, we'd actually create posters of our values and put them all over the walls. And what, what we found was that with, when, you, when you do get rid of people because they don't meet the values or they don't scale, their other people, the other employees greatly appreciate it. There may be initially some shock. You may hear some, you may hear some uncertainty about, you know, how, you know, how do I know I'm not going to be next? But ultimately, when everybody meets the, the, when everybody really lives the values, you create a cult-like following in a good way, not a, not a <laughs> um, and that's, uh, that, that is the book, Good to Great, is creating that kind of, you've heard of the Nordstrom's employees called Nordies, you know, the HP, the HP employees once upon a time were called the, it was called like the HP way, and that's what you really want, that's what you really, to, 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 uh, to build a great culture, and, and we did, I mean, we, we you know, for, for years, we won like uh, you know Colorado best best company to work for. You know, we built a culture where people were. We had smart people. They all looked next to them and knew that they wouldn't be there unless they were smart, unless they were good team players, and and uh, and and our other values. And uh, and what happened eventually is the 
is people that did meet the values would self-select out. We didn't have to, we didn't have to uh, um, terminate them. They would terminate themselves because the pressure from the other employees would, would make it so that, you know. You know That's great. It's a good sign of a strong culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So for um, like big visionaries, Google, um, you talk about focus. How would you tell somebody that sees that kind of big vision how to scale it down for investors? So for an entrepreneur that's really thinking big about their longest term, big things like Google, yeah. how to scale that down for investors and focus. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't tell Google what to do with anything because I think they've got a better idea than I do. But, but uh, I would say that um, even Google has a core. You know, search is still their core. They have a lot of peripheral businesses that you know, should typically support their core business of search. Um, but they didn't get started with Google Cars, right? They didn't get, they didn't get started with, with, uh, with all of these, um, you know, with all of these extraneous businesses. They got started with search and then they, and then they're looking for their next, their next, uh, you know, hundred billion dollar um, sector. Um, but I guess to, to answer that question, you start with something that is core, that's going to make you, that you, where you know how, you know how you're going to sell it, what channel you're going to sell it through. You know that, they're, that you're going to be able to generate revenue, start generating revenue, um, and, then, and, then you, and then you mushroom out from there. Great to have a, great to have a vision, but you shouldn't, you, you need to, you need to, be able to articulate your vision concisely, and that's you know, that's important. Very good. Yes. Um, my market uh, is going to be for it's, it's seniors and the new seniors and the baby boomers and sure. sixty plus, which is going to be. So you're asking about um, how to deal with the fact that people's phones are getting so crowded with apps, and particularly in your market, which will be seniors. Right. Yeah. So the. Uh, in general, when you build apps and you build technology, you have to build it forward. You can't, you know, you, it's, it's uh, to build an app for a BlackBerry wouldn't be a great idea. <laughs> right? And so you have to, you have to go, you know, you're going to build an app, you got to build for the latest iOS and Android operating systems. Um, but the problem of, of uh, too many apps, you know, you, you uh, Typically, you're going to keep the apps that are important and are a part of your daily life, right? And you're not going. You're going to try other apps and and eventually either leave them on or remove them. But if it's important enough to you, it's going to change your life. You're not going to get rid of it, or you're going to upgrade your phone. Yeah. And so, in building apps, you have to you have to focus on on the future, not the past. So some phones do get full. It's, it's like you said about creating a massive value so that they make yours a priority. So very good. So next question. What's your opinion of the startup in, uh, ecosystem here in Phoenix uh, comparable to others in the country? And what, what do you think is the strengths and weaknesses? So strengths and weaknesses of the local ecosystem for startups as compared to others that you've seen. Hmm. Um, well, you know, I don't have, my experience is Colorado and Arizona, um, you know, I've been out of New York for a long time. Um, and, uh, and, and compared to, obviously compared to Silicon Valley and San Francisco, it's, it's light. Um, compared to Denver, you know, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a little lighter, but somewhat comparable. Um, but I, I guess, you know, for, it, it largely depends on what kind of business you're trying to start. If you're, because, uh, I know for, you know, if I'm planning on, if I'm planning on using suppliers, I, you know, I'm, I'm using suppliers all over the country. Um, if you're looking to raise money, then, you know, then you might, you know, the, then you might depend on the local, eco, the local startup ecosystem. Um, but, uh, but I think it's, you know, I think it's uh, certainly adequate to, it's a lot better than Durango, Colorado. <laughs> so we have time for one or two more. Um, let's see here. So, yeah? Kind of piggyback on that. Starting with these seniors, will it have an effect long term? And my second question is, is he available for a quick rate readjust later? 
<laughs> so, uh. starting a business in Phoenix, will it affect you long term, and what's the best way to reach you later? Uh. So, I guess their question is, could I, could I have done it here? No, like, would it be possible to start a startup in Phoenix, yeah. you know, to keep it low key and get it off the ground, and mm -hmm. then Sure, but you know, I think that why would you want to move it someplace else? You know, you know I think the uh, when you when you do get a great culture going with great people, you know, the last thing you want to do is is uh, is tell the people, especially if you're growing like crazy. Uh, hey, we need to mo we're moving the company to California. I hope you can make it. <laughs> you know, so if anything, what you do is you add maybe you add, add a a another location, and maybe that location um, is located in a place that's easier to get the resources that you need, whether employees or something else. And best way to reach out to you is on LinkedIn. Uh, yes. Okay. Best. Uh, yeah. Best way to reach me is on LinkedIn for sure. Very good. All right. One more question. Go ahead. Um, but when did you decide it was right to take in a financial partner? And I'm sure those entrepreneurs are growing their business, getting mm -hmm. approached by venture capital funds, private equity funds. For you, what was mm -hmm. what made you do a deal with Silver Lake? So okay. when when did you decide, and how did you know it was time to take on a financial partner? So, so it was 2010, and we, you know, just a little background. Uh, there were you know we we did take on my brother and I took on another an, another partner. I think in 2006, that was from the industry and was, you know, previously successful in the payment industry, and uh, and so it was my brother and Larry and myself, and we were we we were like uh, the three of us were each on you know we each were on different pages on what we wanted from the business. Um, different risk and different reward profiles. And so, you know, it got to the point where we wanted to sell the business in 2010. And after 2008, the, I mean, in 2008, the market tanked. And, and that's really when we, were, we started looking. And, you know, we took on, we, we got an investment banker and they created a huge, like, prospectus, which took a year. And we waited out the market, and uh, and what we realized is that in selling the company, and we did get a couple of offers, uh, we if we actually um, it, it, the, it looked like you know we we in selling sixty one percent of the business, it was you know we 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 were able to keep thirty nine percent of the business. Um, when the same when other companies were offering us to buy a hundred percent of the business, you know the same the same or less, and so we did the deal with Silver Lake. You know we still we still maintain thirty nine percent of the business, and you know that and uh, fast forward to um, when we sold the the uh, the rest of the business. You know essentially that thirty nine percent was the equivalent of the sixty one percent. You know, years later, about four years later, five years later. Very good. All right, give him a hand, you guys. Thank you so much for coming, Jeff.